coming to the lecture on pulmonary function testing. So I'll probably split this PowerPoint up. Uh, so you'll probably see both a one and a two videos just to sort of break it down a little bit easier. And I'll try to make some other videos as well, just to make sure that you're getting this across. Uh, it's a lot of a concept when we're moving into subjects of diagnostics. So we'll try to make it slow. And whenever in doubt, you can always pause, rewind, re-listen to it later as well. Uh, what you'll see here on the screen is a link uh, to the Thoracic Society. So the American Thoracic Society and the European Respiratory Society both are the, the organizations that uh, put out the standards for pulmonary function testing. And they're the ones that uh, go uh, and decide what would determine reproducibility for results, acceptability for results, uh, what the results could indicate, and so on. So I do encourage you to go to the, that website uh, as well to get further information. So the first thing that we'll talk about is why do we do pulmonary function testing? And when we're doing this, this is looking at gas exchange. Gas exchange is what should go into this box here, right? Gas exchange is the most important function of the lungs. And do you not agree? Gas exchange between the alveoli and the capillary is a crucial role to life. If you can't ventilate and exchange CO2 and O2, then that means that you can't get oxygen to your bloodstream, you can't get oxygen to your brain, you can't get oxygen to your tissues. That also means you can't get rid of CO2 from your tissues, right? So life tends to not live so long if you can't ventilate or if you can't breathe, exchange gas. So when pulmonary function testing looks at how easily you can exchange gas and it can quantify, you're like someone comes in and they're saying, I have trouble breathing. That's something, but how can you quantify that, right? There's something called the modified Borg scale that we'll talk about down the road. But really, how do you numerically quantify how bad their gas exchange is? Well, you have to use pulmonary function testing. You have to use diagnostic testing to really give you specific numbers and that's what we're doing here with pulmonary function testing it gives us specific numerical values about how severe or not severe someone's gas exchange is their ability to exchange gas when we're looking at this this is the second bullet point here the ability for lungs to exchange gas depends on four functions right so when we're doing pfts we can look at different parts of these functions. So one of the first ones that we'll see here is diaphragmatic and thoracic muscle function, right? Diaphragmatic and thoracic muscle function. So if someone has a neuromuscular issue like ALS or SMA or Guillain-Barre or myasthenia gravis, if they have some sort of neuromuscular issue, I want to know how strong that diaphragm is. I want to know if they have the ability to take a deep breath in and cough. I want to know if they have the ability to breathe normally without working hard. I want to know if that diaphragm is functional. If someone's on a ventilator, how do I know if someone's diaphragm is strong enough to take them off? Well, pulmonary function testing gives us that numerics, right? We can see how how strong their muscle is by actually measuring it. It's called a maximum inspiratory pressure or a negative inspiratory force, a MIP or a NIF. And we'll get into that later on down the road. But we can actually see that with numerical values. So we can see how strong their, their diaphragm is. So that tells us what's their ability to breathe, what's their strength of their diaphragm, especially if they've been on paralytics, if they're have a neuromuscular condition of some sort, right? We can always look at that. The second point within here is we can look at patent airways for obstructive gas flow to the respiratory zone. So we want to look for open airways, right? We want to look for patent or open airways for unobstructive gas flow to the respiratory zone. This is prominent in your patients that have obstructive lung disease, like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD, uh, asthma, is an obstructive lung disease, cystic fibrosis is an obstructive lung disease, bronchiectasis, emphysema, right? So we have a bunch of obstructive lung diseases. That means there's something blocking gas from flowing into 
or out of the airways, right? So it can look at obstructive gas flow to the respiratory zone. And this not only includes airways within the lungs, but also the upper airway too, like your vocal cords. If someone has a vocal cord dysfunction, their vocal cords could be covering half of their trachea as they're breathing and make it harder for gas to get into their lungs. It can make it harder for gas to go to their respiratory zone. So it looks at open airways for unobstructed gas flow to the respiratory zone. Then we're gonna look at cardiovascular performance to circulate the blood through the lungs, right? So when we're looking at gas exchange, we can get gas into the lungs, but we also need cardiovascular performance to circulate the blood through the lungs. If someone has right-sided heart failure, that means that right ventricle is not squeezing very well. What's going to be the ability to pump good, strong blood through the pulmonary artery to get it through the lungs so it could pick up oxygen? It's going to be very diminished. And so we can also look at cardiovascular performance as well. And that's one of the things when we're doing pulmonary function testing, uh, we also look at it as cardiovascular as well because we can see uh, if there's a cardiovascular component to their breathing issues. Uh, and sometimes people have both, right? They might have a pulmonary and a cardiac issue like right-sided heart failure, core pulmonary, or even left-sided heart failure where blood's backing up in their lungs, right? So we need to look at that. That that tells us what's gonna help get oxygen to their, their body and help them overall. And then finally, the last one here is diffusion of gas through the alveolar capillary membrane. Diffusion of gas through the alveolar capillary membrane. So one of the pulmonary function tests that we do is called the diffusion of carbon monoxide. And there's two forms of it, and we'll talk about it later. Uh, but pretty much what we do is we have the patient inhale a very low, low amount of carbon monoxide. It's less than what you get at a bus, bus stop. So when you're inhaling this carbon monoxide, you're going to take a deep breath in, hold it, and then we'll have you hold it for 10 seconds and then you're going to let it out. And I'm going to measure how much carbon monoxide you inhaled, which we know that, and then how much carbon monoxide is exhaled and we'll subtract the difference. This tells us how easy it is for gas to diffuse into your bloodstream because do you not remember, carbon monoxide diffuses over 200 times more into the bloodstream to the hemoglobin molecule than oxygen does. So this tells us about the thickness of the AC membrane, how hard or easy it is to get oxygen from the alveoli into the capillary. Well, the thicker the membrane, if we get a really, really thick membrane here, well, there's going to be less carbon monoxide that can make it into the bloodstream. And that diffusion is going to be very poor. So it can tell us, hey, their pulmonary fibrosis is getting worse, right? There's something going on that's making that membrane thick uh, and we're not being able to diffuse gas into there as easily. So it can really help us look at that alveolar ventilation component. So when we're looking at this, PFTs they give us information about all of these things. We can look at muscle strength. We can look at how obstructed the airways are, right, to get gas into and out of the lungs. We can look at the performance of the cardiovascular system. We can look at the diffusion, right? So when we're looking at a pulmonary function test, what's the purpose of it if we have chest x-rays and we have stethoscopes? Well, we can aid in diagnosing. We can see how mild, moderate, severe their obstructive airways is. We can see how severe Severe, their, we can quantify, right? We can quantify how severe their restrictive disease is. We can quantify how bad their diffusion is. We can give those numerical values and we can take action earlier in their disease process to helpfully help with better outcomes for that patient. So diagnosing, absolutely great for diagnosing. Assessment of severity, that's what we just talked about. I can know if someone is obstructive versus restrictive disease, and I can tell you how severe it is, which would then tell us what aggression we need to have with the therapeutic interventions, like uh, inhalers. Do we need to go with a steroid inhaler? Do we need to add a bronchodilator? Do we need to add a long act beta agonist? Do we need to add more types of medications to this? Uh, do we need to add things like that? Uh, determines the need for therapy. If we have someone who has uh, issues breathing when they're working out and they have a possibility of exercise induced bronchospasm or if we have a, someone that uh, just has very reactive airways 
then we can see, we can do a pulmonary function test, have them blow into a device, give them a breathing treatment, and then have them repeat that same measurement. And then if it increases by over 12% or 200 mLs, uh, then we know that they are responsive, that they need that therapy, right? Determines that they need that therapy. It's something that they bought, their body responds to. So we can also see at the last part here, evaluate the effectiveness of respiratory care, right? So if we give a medication and we see that response, we see that they can blow out faster or they can take a deeper breath, then that tells us that our treatment is currently effective for the patient. But what if we give it and we don't see those changes, right? And that's where we come to it, where we need to make sure that we're then going forward with a different therapeutic intervention, a different approach to that patient's therapy. So what are your expectations here? The big thing is to know how to perform the test. It's you. This is very coaching dependent. Uh, patient effort dependent is the big thing. So that means if it's patient effort dependent, that means the coaching dependency is there. So you coaching a patient, being excited over this. Like, okay, take a deep breath in and blow really hard. Keep going, keep going, keep going, right? Really getting the most effort out of them is important to making sure they get the right diagnosis, uh, the right concentrations of medicine, the right uh, routes. Uh, so it's big, big, big that you know how to perform these tests and we'll practice this in course. Uh, we also need to make sure that we're obtaining accurate information. How many times did they they try to do this? Uh, what was their true height on it? Uh, are they sort of fudging their height? Because that can really change the values. Uh, we need to make sure that we're recording everything appropriately so that way the right diagnosis, the right therapy, all that good stuff can be done appropriately. Uh, we also, since we're the ones performing the test usually, uh, it's troubleshooting, calibrating, and disaffecting the equipment. The last thing you want is someone with already compromised lung issues to get a pulmonary infection, right? So dis disinfecting would be a big thing. Making sure the equipment is calibrated and appropriate for that patient is, is important. And in fact, uh, you have to do that every day someone tests. And then troubleshooting. What if there's a leak in the system when you're doing the carbon monoxide testing, right? So we have to make sure we go through those things. I want you to be able to interpret the measurements. Now, can you as the respiratory therapist diagnose someone? Well, no, that's not our job. Our our point to this is to interpret the measurements. Why do I want you to do that? So if you see if it's restrictive, obstructive, combined, if there's a diffusion impairment, uh, you're going to need to know these these uh, these uh, m these routes so that way you can go ahead and go through this when you go to mechanical ventilation and you see patients with obstructive, restrictive, uh, poor diffusion issues, these disease processes, when we put them on mechanical ventilation, we need to adjust how we set our ventilators to what's going on with these patients' disease processes. So when you're interpreting these measurements, I want you to sort of see that. See what's obstructive, see what's restrictive, see what's combined, see what has poor diffusion, what has poor muscle function. Because not only does it matter here that you know what these interpretations are, even though we're not interpreting it officially, but I want you to be able to interpret it for what it means for someone's disease process. So if someone comes in and they need mechanical ventilation and they have obstructive disease like emphysema, COPD, then you know they're going to have poor diffusion. You know they're going to have a hard time getting gas into and out of their lungs. You know that we're going to have to worry about gas trapping and air trapping, right? So you're going to know this from the world of diagnostics and PFTs. The better you understand the PFT world, the better you'll be at mechanical ventilation. Right. If that's your goal, then no matter what, neonate, pediatric, adult, the better you understand pulmonary function and physiology, the better you'll be at mechanical ventilation. You will be. Right. So I want you to be able to identify the pulmonary impairment. Is it a restrictive disease, obstructive disease, combined condition? And we'll practice this with some case studies. I want you to be able to quantify how severe it is. Is it mild, moderate, severe? Is it within normal limits? Is it the lower levels of normal? 
And then I want you to understand the diagnostic and therapeutic roles that we play in here, especially when we start talking about pulmonary function testing uh, and what it means to the medications they're on or the therapeutic interventions like oxygen therapy and other things like that that they're on as well. Those will uh, help you out further on in this process. So what are some indications for diagnostics? So when we're looking at diagnostics, is there a lung disease, right? Someone gets short of breath and they don't know why, well, they can come in and do a diagnostic test. Is there a lung disease, right? Compared to getting a chest x-ray or something like that, I can see really quickly having them blow into the machine uh, if there's a, a lung disease present or not, right? That we can detect there. So is there a lung disease? Is the restrictive, obstructive, combined, right? Right? Is there an issue with gas getting in and out, or is it an issue with gas not being able to go in enough, right? What type of impairment is present? Is it restrictive, obstructive, combined? How bad is it? Is there more than one type of impairment present? Is it possible that someone has um, morbid obesity and a, a, an obstructive airway condition like asthma? Is it possible that someone has asthma and morbid obesity? Yes, it is possible. So we can see if there's more than one type of impairment going on and then therefore help them the care team make a better plan. Uh, and then we can see if there's multiple lung diseases uh, uh, that we can separate out. If we have someone that has low diffusion and obstructive issues, then that's going to be emphysema every time, right? Uh, so that's something that we can look at there too, if we can be specific about what disease process they have as well. What does it mean for therapeutic interventions? What do we do with this patient? Is their therapy indicated? So if they have a lung disease, then we can see, do they respond to medications is one of the things, right? Was the treatment that they're getting effective? Is there another thing that we could do that's more effective? How reversible is it? Are, are we giving them strong enough doses? Uh, is what we're doing not working at all or working some or working really well? Can uh, treatments be evaluated? Can we do something further that's more appropriate? Is pulmonary rehabilitation something that's feasible for this patient? Is it something that they qualify for? So you can see there's a lot of evidence here that not only is it valuable for diagnostic reasons, like an outpatient healthy-ish person that comes into the PFT lab, but also therapeutically, what does it mean for that patient? How can we help them have better activities of daily living, live a better life, live a life more prepared for what's going on in the world around them and not have to be scared of their shortness of breath that they get here and there? So we can be a part of that. So what are some indications for this? And when we're looking at indications, well, we need to find and quantify changes in lung function. Uh, so that's one of the things that we'll have to be looking at here. Or evaluate the need for a therapeutic effect, like someone that has asthma, right? Do they need an albuterol inhaler? Do they need a steroid inhaler to help control any inflammatory issues? Do they need, uh, if it's extrinsic asthma where it's allergies that cause it, do they need anti-allergy or antihistamines, right? So we can keep tabs on pulmonary disease if they have pulmonary uh fibrosis, then we can see how bad their DLCO is getting and keep tabs on it. If it's uh, obstructive disease, we can keep tabs on how their FEV 1% or how fast they can exhale uh, is changing over time, and then we can change the strength of our medications. We can also look and evaluate the risk for post-operative pulmonary complications, especially if they're not taking deep breaths, or if, they're, say, someone's going to go in for a bariatric surgery, is that person, after they breathe very shallowly after surgery, right, are they going to be able to take enough deep breaths? Are they going to have enough lung function capabilities to recover from a general surgery and not get a pulmonary infection that could cause them to pass away, right? So we can mitigate risks of postoperative pulmonary complications by doing a pre-procedure PFT. And we used to do this quite a bit when I was working in the PFT lab. 
Uh, then finally, we can determine if someone needs pulmonary disability. I think there was an old speedable question from, uh, the, uh, I think it was California, that, that stated if someone's number was less than one liter at an FEV 1%, then they actually qualified for disability. So that's one of the things that we can look for. If someone's lung function is so poor, is that something that qualifies them for assistance? So we'll see all different indications for this in the PFT lab. Contraindications. So contraindications to pulmonary function testing. And hopefully these pictures help you remember a little bit. I'm a picture guy. I need pictures, right? Uh, hemoptysis is going to be one of the first ones that I would think about. If someone's coughing up blood, the pulmonary function test is not for them. This is not an, an acute life-saving procedure, right? This is a diagnostic procedure that we can use for therapeutics, but it's a diagnostic procedure that's done when the patient is relatively stable. So if they're actively coughing up blood, uh, that's hemoptysis, then that's not something that we'll do at that time. We can always reschedule that. Uh, PTX is a pneumothorax, right? A hole in their lungs. If we're having someone take deep breaths, inhale, exhale, really fast, really hard, what's going to happen to that hole in their lungs? Is it going to get better or could it possibly get worse? So it would be an untreated pneumothorax, uh, right? So that's something we don't want to do anything with because what's the Hippocratic Oath? It's first do no harm. So we want to make sure that we're watching that as well. Uh, if someone's having a heart attack, that's not good, right? Uh, heart attack, chest pain, right? Heart attack, chest pain. When we're looking at both of these, uh, heart attack and chest pain, those are bad signs. Now, if their chest pain is chronic, right? Let's say they have chronic angina. That's a whole separate thing. But if it's an acute chest pain, right? Keyword there is acute. Uh, same thing with an MI, right? If it's an acute situation. Now, did they have a heart attack a year ago? Well, yes, we can do the PFT as long as they're not having a new one. But same thing with the acute chest pain. If it's acute, we don't do it. But if it's uh, something that they've recovered from or their baseline is that baseline chronic chest pain, then we can still do it. Uh, what's PE? Well, that's a pulmonary embolus. That's what this picture is over here. So if there's a PE that's unresolved in their lungs or untreated PE, what are we doing with the lungs when we're telling them to breathe deep, uh, inhale and exhale? What happens to the vascularity? It actually puts a lot of pressure on that vascularity. Uh, dimension or confusion, uh, that's going to be one of your big ones there. Uh, if the pa patient cannot follow directions, uh, there's a lot of coaching that goes along with these tests. And you guys are going to experience it in class. I'll have you coach each other through these tests. Uh, and that's going to be one of your checkoffs is coaching through a pulmonary function test. So uh, if they're unable to follow the directions to perform the procedure, then that is a contraindication because then we can't get accurate data. And this whole thing is so we can get as accurate data as possible. And finally, sort of a, a weird one here is cat recent cataract removal. Removal. And so the whole point of this, we're doing a lot of pulmonary pressures. We're changing a lot of volumes. We're changing a lot of things. So those pulmonary pressures really can change intraoscular, intracranial, right? Uh, ocular, ocular, ocular pressures. So therefore, it could change a lot of things there. If they've had a ruptured eardrum, uh, that's another thing that we could look at as well because that can change a lot of things in their breathing. So we got to watch out for these contraindications. I'll put these in the case studies too, but if someone has active hemoptysis, they're having a heart attack or a PE that's not resolved yet or acute chest pain or they're unable to follow directions and there's maybe a minor hole in their lungs, then again, we're not going to do it now. We can always reschedule it. I had a patient uh, where they ordered a PFT. I was working in the PFT lab that day and I went over to pick them up. They were an inpatient of the hospital uh, to go take them to the PFT lab. And sure enough, I was looking in their chart and they sa it said that they had a pneumothorax. It was not resolved. It was a low enough that it wasn't going to be treated. So they were letting it resolve itself, reabsorb itself, if you will. Uh, so that's one where we just had to reschedule it uh, until the x-ray was clear of a pneumothorax. So just be careful of these, right? Uh, the boards will ask you a little bit about these. Uh, if you see any of these conditions going on that I just talked about that are on the screen that I just drew all over, <laughs> uh, then don't, don't do the PFT. All right, let's talk about obstructive, restrictive, or both. 
They can happen together or they can happen as separate situations. So an obstructive condition, and we'll talk about obstructive conditions first, that means there's something blocking gas flow, right? So if you were to take a garden hose and kink it in the middle of the garden hose, that means something's blocking the gas flow, right? There's an obstruction of water flowing through that hose. Well, same thing here. This is something going through the airways, right? It's an airway issue. Something's obstructing those airways, whether it's a foreign body, vocal cords, or tissue, right? Where it's swollen tissue or something like that that's going on, a mucus plug, you name it. Uh, it's blocking gas from flowing into and out of the lungs. That means there's gonna be a lot of resistance to gas going in and out, airway resistance. This means your trans airway pressure goes up, right? And we talked about this in pulmonary AMP. I know, great memories. Uh, what are some major causes of this? Well, chronic bronchitis, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, asthma, emphysema, right? All these things are obstructive issues besides having things like tumors or mucus plugs or foreign obstructions, right? If someone inhales a corn dog, right? Uh, those would all be obstructive as well. So we are looking at that blocking of gas flow into and out of that conducting airways and medium and small airways as well. We're looking at that. So causes, those are those obstructive conditions that I just named out. Now over here, we'll use red here. Over here, we'll look at restrictive conditions. This means that the lung can't expand. Oh, imagine someone getting, uh, giving you a giant compressive bear hug, right? What's gonna be your ability to take a deep breath in that scenario? It's gonna be very low, right? It's gonna restrict your lung expansion. And that's what we're looking at here. Gas can flow in and out of their lungs really well with a restrictive disease. So there's nothing really wrong with their, their tubes. Their tubes are fine. The issue is the container at the end of the tubes is actually smaller, right? So they can't get as much gas into or out of their lungs. So this is usually lungs that have low lung compliance, lungs that have the poor ability to expand, whether it's from the tissue being swollen like pneumonia or from something outside the lungs like a pleural fusion or third trimester pregnancy pushing up against it or uh, kyphoscoliosis, right? The lungs can't expand. Do you guys remember the calculations for resistance and compliance? I hope you do because you're going to need those throughout the whole program and in the field too. So lung compliance, how is that calculated? It's the change in volume over the change in pressure. So it's mLs per centimeter of water. Normal for a spontaneously breathing person is around 100 mLs per centimeter of water. And hopefully you remember that. Uh, but the big things with this, if it's a restrictive issue, it can be lung tissue being the issue, or it can be something extra thoracic that's doing it. So if it's the lung tissue, like really sick pneumonia or bad pulmonary fibrosis where the lungs are pretty much scarring over, uh, that's the tissue itself. The lung tissue is not allowing for it to expand. It's very elastic and it's not very compliant. And then the extra thoracic restriction we talked about a second ago, where that could be a third trimester pregnancy. It could be a pleural fusion. So fluid around the lung. It could be a chest wall issue like kyphoscoliosis, right? Uh, something like that could be restricting the ability for the thoracic cage to expand altogether. I've seen this with ascites and so on and so forth, or a person with massive amount of blood in their abdomen, right? It's going to push up against the lungs and restrict their ability to breathe. So when we're looking at this, we're looking with PFTs, we're gonna see, hey, does this person have a restrictive issue where the lungs can't expand? Do they have an obstructive issue where we can't get gas into or out of their lungs? Or do they have something that's both, right? What we were talking about before with someone that has morbid obesity and asthma, that's both. They have that restrictive process and obstructive process, right? So we're gonna look at this uh, and we'll do some case studies about this together because we treat these different and causes of these can be different as well. 
Here are some pictures from your Egan's book. And this is showing that obstructive much better than my drawings, of course. Uh, and over here is your normal, right? Normal, uh, where gas can flow into and out of the alveolus pretty easily. And then over here is your obstruction, where there's something stuck in the airway. So how much gas can go past this little area here versus over here? A lot less gas. And if you remember, there was something called Posey's Law. And Posey's Law says, the smaller the radius of a tube, the higher the resistance of gas there is to flow through that. So that means less gas will flow through there, so lower flow rates, and it will take higher pressures to get gas into and out of the lungs. So in this situation, we're going to see that it's going to take more pressure to get gas to go into and out of the lungs. That means they're going to have to use their accessory muscles. And then we're going to see that it's going to cause low flow rates. Low flow rates. Low flow rates is what I just drew there. So low flow rates means that just like putting a garden hose in half, right, just like kinking it, you're going to see a lot less water coming out of the end there. That means a lot less gas can flow into and out of the lungs when we're looking at this condition. On the right side here, moving on over, I'll go to blue here. Here we see, a, once again, an open airway, nice and easy. Gas can go in and out really well. And then over here on the restrictive side, same thing. Gas can go in and out really well. Okay, good news. Gas can go in and out really well. However, what happened to the volume of that lung? Well, they were unable to get that same amount of volume in there. So therefore, it's restricting the lung from expanding. Okay, so anything that restricts the lung from expanding, whether it's tissue or chest wall abdomen issues, then that's a restrictive disease. So like I said before, we can have an issue where it's both, where someone has obstructive over here and they have restrictive. That's a bad combo, but it does happen. But that way we can know what's going on with the patient and help find a therapeutic intervention that, was a, that would be appropriate to them. So hopefully you see a little compare and contrast here with restrictive and obstructive disease. Remember with obstructive diseases, uh, you're gonna have that higher pressures and lower flow rates. So they're gonna work harder to breathe and they're gonna have a lot less ability to get gas into and out of their lungs. So it's gonna be a very, very difficult situation. Speaking of which, we will start with the obstructive diseases. So as airway resistance goes up, flow rate decreases, right? As we kink a garden hose, right? Uh, what happens to the amount of water coming out of the end of it? Yeah, it decreases the flow rate of that water coming out of the end of it. And same thing here, uh, even with traffic. I know I love to bring up traffic for you guys, but here you go. Here's an obstruction in the road, right? So things are getting smaller. How many cars can fit past through that roadway than they could before? A lot less cars can get through there as fast. So things slow down, as you know, with road construction, right? Uh, so airway resistance will increase with a decrease in the radius. So that means the smaller the tube, the more resistance there is to breathing, which you know this from Posey's Law. The smaller the tube, the harder it is to get gas to flow into and out of it. And that's what it's saying here. The smaller the tube, the harder it is for gas to go into and out of it. So what are some examples of a small airway radius? Well, here you go. I put one down here. Uh, uh, choking. <laughs> if there's a obstructive in there, something like that could easily be doing, like a foreign aspiration or external manipulation like you see in that picture. Uh, a vocal cord dysfunction would make a small airway radius. Uh, so we see with little kids, especially if inhaling foreign objects, uh, would be an option there. Uh, also, uh, any of your obstructive lung diseases, your chronic bronchitis, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, emphysema, and asthma, those are obstructive conditions. Uh, if there's a tumor uh, that's blocking things, right? All those things would make it hard for gas to flow into and out of the lungs and make their airway radius smaller. Uh, swelling of the airways, right? massive inflammation of the airways can do this as well. Mucus plugging for your patients that don't have adequate humidity or hydration, uh, that can be a big thing there. So whenever you see low flow rates on a pulmonary function, pay attention to this because I know you zoned out somehow. <laughs> low flow rates, anytime you see low flow rates, that means you have an obstructive airway situation present. Anytime you see a low flow rate, you mean you have obstructive airway condition is present. 
So any flow rates that we look at in a pulmonary function test, if the flow rates are low, that means there's an obstructive condition present. Uh, usually these patients that have airway obstruction have a more difficult time with exhaling. Well, why is this? Well, when you exhale, what happens to the radius of your airways? When you inhale, what happens to the radius of your airways? So when you inhale, the radius of your airways expands, right? <gasps> And then when you exhale, what happens? Right? They get a little bit smaller. Now, are they? is it a drastic, ginormous change? No, it's not a drastic, ginormous change. But And you won't notice it naturally. However, if you have an obstructive condition, like chronic inflammation of your airways, like uh, excessive destruction of your airways that we see with emphysema where they become floppy, they're going to get that much smaller on exhale and trap gas into their lungs. That means that gas can't escape or we're having a harder time getting gas to escape. And that's what we call the air trapping or the auto peep that we've talked about before. So we got to be careful. So these patients usually will have a more difficult time exhaling. Like I said, one of my things when I would go in to evaluate a patient, uh, I would say, are you having trouble inhale, exhale, or both? If they're saying they're having trouble exhaling, then that's usually one of the things that would tell me I'm dealing with an obstructive condition because I didn't have the PFT thing on me right at the bedside. But uh, that was one of the ways I could sort of tell. Obstructive conditions have a harder time exhaling because the airway radius gets smaller and therefore the ability to get gas out of there a lot harder. Flow rates will decrease. So the next question or the last bullet point on here, what will happen to the pressure it takes to get an adequate flow into the lungs? Well, if the radius is smaller, the pressure it takes to get the same amount of gas in there increases. So this means we'll have an increase in what's called the work of breathing. WOB is work of breathing. That means they're going to use a lot of accessory muscles. <sighs> they're going to really work hard to pull that gas in because they have to create a stronger pleural pressure. They have to create even more suction pressure to pull gas past there, right? Imagine you're over here and we'll go to the next slide. Imagine you're over here trying to drink a milkshake, right? You're over here trying to drink this lovely milkshake over here, right? Uh, you have a nice large straw. It's very thick. Now, imagine if you were to take this compression straw and you drop that previous straw on the ground. Now you're trying to use this compression straw over there. Okay. Smaller radius. Yes which means you're going to have to do what to get the same amount of milkshake into your mouth? You're going to have to pull that much harder, right? So the smaller the radius, the more pressure it takes to get that gas flow, when we're talking about lungs, to get that gas flow in and out of your lungs. So they're going to have to work harder. You're going to see these accessory muscles used to help them breathe. So as the airways become smaller, you're gonna see that work of breathing, the accessory muscle usage, they can be sweaty, they can uh, uh, see all their accessory muscles, you could see them do a position called tripoding. You can see all these things happen as, as it gets worse. So the smaller the radius, the more pressure it takes to get gas to flow through there. Well, what, what does that mean for mechanical ventilation? You're like, Derek, you're boring me with the PFT thing. Well, mechanical ventilation, Someone has really severe asthma, really small airways, what does that mean for the amount of pressure it takes to deliver a breath to their respiratory zone? Well, it's going to increase. It's going to take a lot more trans airway pressure to get gas into and out of their lungs. All right, restrictive disease. This means we have the poor ability for the lungs to expand. And I was trying to find a good picture here, and hopefully this gives you a good visual image. Once again, I like these visuals. But here we see someone doing a tight bear hug, right? And it's going to really limit that bunny's ability to expand their chest wall, expand it all. So this means we have the ability to get gas to and from the airways. That's okay. But the airways themselves aren't able to contain much volume at all. So this is at the, about the volume of your airways, right? Volume of your airways, not the ability to get gas to and from, right? Obstructive is the ability to get gas to and from. Restrictive is the ability to expand or have, have an adequate size container to have that volume. So anytime we see low volumes on a pulmonary function test, Anytime we see low volumes on the pulmonary function test, we're thinking a restrictive process is happening. 
a restrictive process is happening. Uh, this can be caused by sick lung tissue, like I said, with pulmonary fibrosis, where the lungs are scarring up, or ARDS, where the lungs are filled with a bunch of fluid and scarring up, right? So that could be restrictive due to sick lung tissue. Uh, it can also be restricted by extrathoracic means, right? By pleural effusion squishing in, or a pneumothorax squishing in, or uh, uh, kyphoscoliosis squishing in, right? Restricting the ability for the lungs to expand from the outside. Uh, uh, ileus, or ascites, or anything like that that's really restricting the ability for the lungs to expand. So it can be pulmonary tissue or extra pulmonary. Uh, it can be also from inspiratory muscle weakness like we see with neuromuscular issues, spinal cord injury patients, things like that. Their ability to expand their chest wall is limited because they, they don't have that strength or they, there's something else going on there. These patients overall we'll have a difficult time inhaling. Now remember, obstructive was the difficult time exhaling. This one is a difficult time inhaling. Obstructive, difficult time exhaling. Restrictive, difficult time inhaling. Well, why is this? Because how much can they contain? Could you imagine someone squeezing your chest cavity like you see in this picture up here, right? Could you imagine someone squeezing you so hard? Uh, is that gonna be a hard time inhaling or exhaling? You tell me right? That's definitely going to be a hard time inhaling, right? Can that bunny exhale? Probably very well, <laughs> but they can't inhale. They can't expand their lung tissue very well. So inhaling would usually mean there's a restrictive process present. Uh, so let me ask you this. Let's play a little game here. A pneumothorax, is that restrictive, obstructive, or both? Well, a pneumothorax is a hole in the lung, right? And so does that have to do with the conducting zone? No, it has nothing to do with the conducting zone traditionally. So what happens is gas builds up in the pleural space and causes a restriction for the ability to expand because there's gas built up in the pleural space. Uh, what about a pleural effusion, right? There's a bunch of fluid that's built up around the outside of the tissue of the lungs. So what's going to happen? Is it the issue with the, the primary airways getting gas to and from the lung or the ability to expand the lung? Well, it's the ability to expand the lung because it's restricting it from expanding it. What about morbid obesity? Something's pushing up on the lungs, the chest wall and the abdomen, and that's one of the reasons why we position uh, morbid obese patients uh, uh, differently, even on mechanical ventilation, because it can uh, cause restriction on their ability to expand their lungs and make it harder to ventilate. What about asthma? Is that something to do with the expansion of the lung, or is that something to do with the airways to get gas to and from the respiratory zone? Well, this is the ability to get gas to and from the respiratory zone. So this one would be obstructive, right? What about chronic bronchitis or bronchiectasis, right? Chronic bronchitis, uh, bronchitis means there's inflammation or swelling of your conducting zone in your tubes, right? So these are all the airways that are swollen. Well, is that going to obstruct gas flow or is that going to restrict the lungs from expanding? Well, this one, it's inflammation of your conducting zone. So it's going to obstruct the movement of gas right? What about pneumonia? Pneumonia is inflammation of the respiratory zone specifically. So bronchitis will say this is conducting zone, and then pneumonia will say this is respiratory zone, right? Respiratory zone inflammation versus conducting zone inflammation. So conducting zone inflama inflammation would be bronchitis. Pneumonia would be respiratory zone inflammation, swelling around that loose space Remember we talked about loose space in pulmonary AMP? This would be that swelling, that lymph tissue, and that loose space. So what's happening? The ability for the, the respiratory zone to expand is restricted, right? So pneumonia, a lot of people think pneumonia is obstructive. Well, if you have asthma on top of it and you have asthma attack on top of it, sure. But it's actually inflammation of the respiratory zone, so therefore in, it inhibits the ability for the respiratory zones to expand. So similar to what we got up there in that picture. The inability to stretch, if you will, makes swollen tissues a lot harder to stretch. Uh, what about third trimester of pregnancy? Is this going to be obstructive or restrictive? Well, traditionally, this is going to be a restrictive issue, right? What's happening to the abdomen? It's pushing up. What's happening to the chest wall? The chest wall is gaining mass. So this is going to restrict the ability for the lungs to expand. What about pulmonary fibrosis, where the tissue of the AC membrane 
is getting really thick. It's scarring, right? We have a lot of scarring here. Uh, so is this going to be a restrictive issue or obstructive issue? Well, it's the respiratory zone issue. So therefore, it's a restrictive issue. What about kyphoscoliosis, right? Severe kyphoscoliosis, that curved spine and thoracic cage. What's going to happen for the ability of the lungs to expand? Well, you can't expand them, so therefore it'll be restrictive. So hopefully you, you get a better picture uh, with me going through this with these pictures and just this little short case study about restrictive versus obstructive pathophysiology. All right, now that you know the difference between restrictive and obstructive, right, take time, make sure that you get that in, and we'll try to hammer it home with case studies in class. But uh, we need to see how bad it is, and some things that we can look at is what happens with these different patients. So with, uh, with the restrictive disease, if we have something going on with the respiratory zone, right? Remember the lung parenchyma was one of those fancy words for it, the thoracic pump. Uh, if we have an issue there, right, going on, we can see what what's happening there. So uh, if we have uh, trouble breathing in, then that usually goes on with restrictive disease. If we have so trouble breathing out, that usually goes along with obstructive disease, right? So these are the characteristics here. Let me just see if that helps you guys out. Uh, if we're having obstructive disease, well, going back up here, if we have an obstructive disease, our issues in our conducting zone, right? So if you want to, conducting zone versus over here in restrictive issue, we'll do respiratory zone issues, right? Do you see that? So uh, we're going to have trouble with our conducting zone, which will cause obstructive disease. Troubles with our restrictive zones would equal restrictive disease. Uh, if we're going to have trouble exhaling, that's traditionally obstructive. Tr uh, if it's inhaling, that's traditionally restrictive. Uh, if we have an increase in airway resistance or raw, we calculate someone's raw or we measure raw with pulmonary function testing, then that goes along with obstructive disease. The size of their tube is smaller, right? If it's a, a, a restrictive disease, then that means the ability for the container to expand is impeded somehow, whether it's the tissue or something uh, around the tissue is really inhibiting it. So over here, we're just seeing a, a big straw to a small straw, right? So that's what we're seeing here. And finally, the useful measurements is the last one on the bottom here. With obstructive disease, if we see low flow rates, right? If we see low flow rates, remember a flow rate is volume over time. So volume over time. So how much water is coming out of the end of a hose would be like a flow rate. If we were to kink it, right, then the flow rate decreases. So when you see a low flow rate on a pulmonary function test, we haven't gone over them yet, but if you see low flow rates, we'll define those later. If you see low flow rates, then that indicates obstructive disease is present. If you see low volumes or capacities, low volumes or capacities, right, that usually means a restrictive issue is present. So here's a neat little table, right, took it directly from your reading material, and hopefully this sort of helps out. A great way to sort of put it all together in one slide, uh, and you can make it a lot neater than what I did here. All right, a little case study for you. So you're at the Renaissance Festival, and you're consuming a medieval meal with food and ale. When the court gesture makes you laugh, an aspiration of a large piece of bread is now in the trachea. The court calls for the gesture to be put in a dungeon for such a thing. Uh, now we're going to see, is this a restrictive or an obstructive issue, okay? So what type of present, process is present in the pulmonary system? So now the question that you should ask yourself, is this in the conducting zone or the respiratory zone? Right? Is it where gas gets exchanged and we have low volumes, or is it in the conducting zone where it, it affects the ability of gas to flow into or out of the lungs? Well, I highlighted it in the trachea. So which one's the trachea? Is the trachea the respiratory zone where we exchange gas with the bloodstream, or is it conducting zone where we remove gas to and from the respiratory zone? Right? So this is going to be a conducting zone issue. So that tells me, is that restrictive or obstructive? Well, I know conducting zone issues 
are obstructive processes. Nice, right? Did you guys see how we did that there? What would happen to breathing? Would he have trouble breathing in or breathing out? Breathing in, breathing out. Well, if we know it's a conducting zone issues, the issue is getting, we can get gas in, but it's harder to get gas out because remember the trachea, the airways get smaller as we exhale. What would happen to lung compliance? Would it increase or decrease? Well, in this situation, it would be no change. No change, right? Because it's not affecting the volumes or capacities. Uh, what would happen to lung volumes? Uh, well, they could potentially be increased because if we can't exhale, what happens to the gas in the lungs? If they can't exhale all of it, it keeps building up and keeps building up and keeps building up and keeps building up, right? It's going to be harder to get gas out. So therefore, that could increase lung volumes. That's why some patients with emphysema will see very high functional residual capacities or very high residual volumes. What would happen to airway resistance? Well, air resistance, of course, would be increased because there's something blocking the trachea, right? Blocking part of the trachea. What would happen to the flow rate or how fast gas can go in and out of the lungs? If something's blocking it, right? If we kink a garden hose, what happens to the amount of flow of water coming out of the end of it? Well, the flow of water will decrease. So if we were to do a pulmonary function test on this guy that's choking, uh, we would see that he had a decreased flow rate. How would one remedy the situation? Well, the hope here would be a Heimlich maneuver. Uh, if, it, if they can't get it out, uh, we could always go in with bronchoscopy and pull it out, things like that. But hopefully you sort of see a good thing of like, okay, is this conducting zone or respiratory zone, right? So if I see a patient that's a severe asthmatic come into the ER and we put them on a ventilator, Conducting zone or respiratory zone? Conducting zone. So I'm going to have an airway resistance issue. It's going to be harder to get gas in, harder to get gas out. Uh, I'm going to have an issue where, where their lungs aren't going to be able to fully exhale, so I have to worry about gas pressure building up in their lungs, right? Saying our next thing to look at is gas flow into or out of that's going to be one of our primary issues that we'll see here. So if you're a person that needs stories, you need a story to help you remember these things, that's why I put these in there. So hopefully you can remember things that obstruct versus things that restrict. And hopefully you will have better, better understanding, better grasp of it. And that's the whole plan is to get you better comfort with this material. So that way you understand not only with pulmonary function testing, what causes the numbers to be the way, the direction that they are, but also with, when we're looking at this, but also with things like mechanical ventilation, what happens with these things as well. The last one that we look at here. Uh, so question, you are at Comic-Con dressed as Wonder Woman with friends, right? Uh, so this could happen, right? It's a plausible scenario uh, when you notice that you're getting tired easily and you have trouble breathing. A friend and fellow RRT uh, <coughs> evaluates your oxygen level, your pulse ox, at 87%. Not good. And they also notice that you have a tachycardia. Your heart rate's going fast. So you have a harder time breathing. Uh, the costume feels like it's getting tighter. So now when I'm looking at this, I'm going to ask you these questions. What type of process is now present with the pulmonary system, restrictive or obstructive? So if it's a really tight costume that's going on here, is that an issue with the conducting zone, right? Your trachea, your bronchi, all those cartilaginous airways, or is it issue with your respiratory zone being restrictive or squished in. So which one is it? So if we know it's an issue with the respiratory zone, that would be a restrictive issue. If it's a conducting zone, that would be an obstructive issue. So since we're not able to expand the lungs, then that's not a conducting zone issue, that's a respiratory zone issue. So this would be a restrictive issue. What would happen to breathing? Is this person, right, in this picture, is this person gonna have trouble breathing in? breathing out? Well, if they're restrictive, they can't expand their lungs, so they're going to have trouble breathing in. 
What would happen to this person's lung compliance? Well, is it going to be increased? Are we going to have a really easy time expanding his lungs or are we going to have a harder time expanding their lungs? Well, since the cost him so tight, what's going to be their ability to expand the lungs? Well, their, their ability to expand the lungs is going to be decreased because we can't expand that rib cage. We're going to have a harder time there. So their lung compliance goes down. What happens to this person's lung volumes? Well, they would be decreased because he can't expand his lungs. What happens to his airway resistance? Well, nothing's going on with the conducting zones that we know of, so therefore there'd be no change, right? No change whatsoever there. What would happen to the flow of gas going into or out of his lungs? Well, once again, there would be no change because nothing happened with the conducting zone. So how would one remedy such a situation? Well, uh, tailoring the costume might not be a bad idea. Uh, you never know. But that would be an easy one to help remove that restrictive process on that patient. And then hopefully they can expand their lungs and their pulse ox comes back up without any further intervention. Uh, and so hopefully you see this. And I'll break the, the PowerPoint presentation here. We're almost at an hour. And what I want you to do is to go through this and understand, hey, what's restrictive? What's obstructive, right? What would cause someone to be restrictive? What does that look like? Trouble breathing in, trouble breathing out. What happens to the, the physiology of gas going into and out of their lungs, right? What happens to the physics of gas? Does it become more turbulent? Does it become more laminar? What happens? So think about that with obstructive. Now think about the same thing with restrictive and go through these things and think about how can we really affect and see the difference? The compare and contrast is going to be vital for you because this first exam, it's not easy, but I want you to, I want, I'm testing, do you know the difference between an obstructive disease and a restrictive disease? And once you know those differences, once you can quantify those differences, that's going to help you execute exponentially, not only in the diagnostics PFT world, but also in the therapeutic world, whether it's doing basic floor therapy, whether it's doing uh, uh, mechanical ventilation, neonate pediatric adult, no matter where it is, the better you understand the physiology changes with disease, the better therapist you will be, whether it's home care, sleep care, subacute care, acute care, whatever it is, you're going to be that much better therapist. Because if you understand these diagnostic tests, you understand what goes into restrictive disease, you understand what goes into obstructive disease, you understand the therapeutic modalities that are associated with restrictive disease right? <laughs> like removing anything that's restricting the lungs from expanding, like a pleural fusion or pneumothorax. Or you understand that these respond to bronchodilators because it's a, it's a conducting zone issue. Uh, then that's going to help you exponentially no matter where you're going to be practicing at. Neonate through adult, uh, home care, subacute care, long-term acute care, acute care, right? It doesn't matter. The better you understand these concepts, the better therapist you will be, the more impactful that you will be uh, for those patients and help them have a much healthier life. So think about this, go back, make a chart, make a table, like what I was trying to draw there a couple slides ago. Hopefully these little stories that I put in there help out, but think about things that cause obstructive issues and things that cause restrictive issues. And then the questions you would ask yourself, is this a respiratory zone issue or a conducting zone issue, right? Uh, do we treat those differently? Of course we do right? So not only do we need to see it for diagnostic purposes, but we also need to see it for therapeutic purposes as well. So that's it for this. I will record another lecture. Uh, and then like I said, please make sure to go back and review as well.